delighted to introduce Michio Resende, who will be our secondary plen second plenary speaker today. Um, Michio is an electrical engineer by trade, but he has a PhD in operations research from the University of California in Berkeley. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. Um, he's actually worked in a lot, you know, in a, in a lot of industry, including Amazon Research, and he's currently an affiliate professor um, at the University of Washington in Seattle. Mauricio is also a, an, a fellow of Informs since 2016, and we are delighted to welcome him for his talk. So I will hand over to you. There will be a Q&A session at the end, but thank you very much. So, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be able to address uh, the society. And I, I'm going to share with you today my perspective of uh, being an academician and, and interacting with people in industry, and then being in industry and interacting with people in academia. Um, so before I start, I want to thank uh, a few people. First, Mitu for the introduction. Uh, uh, Christina for uh, suggesting my name to the committee, uh, and also Christos, Melia, and Maria for uh, uh, and the and the <coughs> OR Society for the kind invitation. Uh, finally, Caitlin and Karen for assistance with logistics. And this is my first trip to Bath, and I really am enjoying myself. And I'm sure I'll be back. Uh, so. Uh, so what about industry and academics? So what, why does one attract the other? So I think that uh, industry attracts people in academia first because it's a source of real problems. Uh, often academic, academicians are, are, are labeled as people who work with uh, uh, unreal problems or small problems or contrived problems or artificial problems. And uh, when they want to uh, find real problems to work on, they can go to industry and find these real problems. Uh, <clears throat> also, if you make some uh, impact in industry, it's possible to get patents. Usually it's easier to get a patent if you're in industry than it is when you're in academia because it's, very, it's a very expensive process and, and in industry, uh, it's uh, quite common to get patents. Uh, as, as it's a source of real problems, it's also a source of big data. So often people in academia work on, on problems with just small data sets. Uh, you, in, in industry, you can have access to massive data sets. Uh, and finally, there are other resources uh, that industry has, uh, being them human talent, computational libraries, et cetera. Uh, and why would a uh, university attract an industrial researcher? Well, one, uh, uh, Universities are a source of a renewable source of human talent. So uh, you're always putting out PhD students and undergrads, and and, and uh, industry would like to tap into those into those resources. Uh, also, there are other other resources, for example, libraries, and uh, uh, and and then perhaps most important is that. Uh, Universities are a source of new ideas. So often in, in industry, you know, you have deadlines and you have uh, meetings and there's little time left over to think about just a new idea. And, uh, and university, uh, you may have more time to think about new ideas and so uh, in, industrial researchers might want to tap into those, uh, into those new, new ideas. So let me describe my journey uh, uh, and it actually began when I was a PhD student back in the 80s uh, uh, at the University of California in Berkeley. So my PhD thesis was on scheduling of semiconductor manufacturing. And uh, after about a year working on the problem, uh, and I had built a uh, simulator for uh, semiconductor manufacturing, uh, and I built it from scratch, so programmed it in C, and had it running on a, on a mini computer. At the time, there, aren't, there weren't powerful workstations yet. Uh, <clears throat> my advisors suggested that I go to, to industry to try to find data to, uh, about the real, the real problem. And, um, and so most of the problems we were working on, I just invented some, some re recipes and so on. And, uh, and so I, I was able to get an uh, internship 
at Fairchild Semiconductor in Palo Alto. For those of you who know California, Bay Area, uh, Palo Alto is about an hour drive from Berkeley. So I spent the summer there uh, working on, uh, mainly on the sim simulator that I started working on uh, in my PhD. And eventually, uh, uh, when I finished the, the, the summer internship, they liked the results so much that they hired me as a consultant. Uh, then for the next two years, I would go every Friday to Palo Alto and work on this. And then, uh, and then, uh, uh, and at the same time, uh, I started working with Narendra Karmakar. Uh, Narendra uh, was from at and Bell Labs, and he had just proposed a new interior point algorithm for, uh, for linear programming. And uh, so let me tell the start, these two stories. So uh, in my PhD thesis, we came up with a, uh, a policy called starvation avoidance. So usually when you build a semiconductor uh, chip, you build a wafer that has hundreds of chips on it. And these, these chips are three-dimensional structures that are, that are actually carved out of the silicon. Uh, and, and this is a process that involves uh, photolithography, some uh, ion implantations and things. And usually you go through many steps for each layer. And, uh, and since these... Uh, semiconductor may have a number of layers. It can take uh, up to 10 weeks to, for, for a wafer to go through the whole process. And, and in this process, uh, there's usually one machine or group of machines that, that, that are, the, that are the, the bottleneck machines. These are very expensive pieces of equipment. At the time in the 80s, uh, photolithography would cost about $2 million each. And so you couldn't have too many of them. And, and, and now if you have a very expensive piece of equipment in your fab, you don't want that equipment to be, uh, to be idle, to be starved for work. And so on the other hand, if you inject, uh, if you inject too much work into the, into the, fab, into the fab, you eventually you, you'll get uh, some cues in your, in your bottleneck, and that will delay the process. And in semiconductor manufacturing, the longer the wafer stays in the, in the fab, the more chance that it'll get contaminated with dust and things. Even though it's a clean, a clean, a clean area, there's still a few particles of dust in the air. And so, so the idea was to, to decide when to inject uh, new work into the factory. And this is what the starvation avoidance does. So basically what we did is we made an analogy between uh, the, the factory uh, and the reorder point inventory control that you'd normally do in a warehouse, right? So you have your, your demand, and it's eating up your, your inventory. It gets, you get to a point where you reach a, the safety stock level, and there you order more inventory. Uh, uh, you, and then that inventory takes some random time to arrive, and when it arrives, it replenishes uh, your inventory, and, then, uh, and that repeats it. So you have these points, which are the reorder points. And what we did is we, we created something called virtual inventory, which is basically the amount of work that's at the bottleneck plus the amount of work that's expected to arrive at the bottleneck within a given lead time. And when that virtual inventory fell, fell below a certain amount, then we would inject new work uh, into, the, into the factory. And so this, uh, this worked quite well. It's being used in a number of fabs around the world. Uh, and, and we wrote this paper, uh, closed loop uh, job release control, and uh, <clears throat> and this paper uh, till today has over 500 citations, and uh, and starvation avoidance, as I said, is used in a number of fabs, and and uh, uh, and uh, some companies have even patented implementations of of starvation avoidance. Uh, now, as I said, we, we did all the analysis using simulations. So the simulator that I wrote, the people at, at, uh, at Fairchild had uh, made a spin-off called Tyson where they actually made this into a product. And this product is, a, is being used in, a, in a, number of, a number of places around the world. Okay, now uh, in 1983, uh, Narendra Karmakar uh, announced to the world that he had a new polynomial time algorithm for linear programming. And at the time, you know, it wasn't such a big deal because polynomial time algorithm for linear programming had already been proposed in 1979. 
uh, by, by Leonid Kachin. And, uh, but what happened is that, uh, uh, so there wasn't, there wasn't so much excit excitement in 1983. However, in 1984, uh, Kamarkar started giving talks around the world claiming that his algorithm was 100 times faster than the simplex method. And, then, and, that's, and that sparked a lot of interest uh, from people uh, all over the place, uh, uh, and, and including in, in Berkeley, uh, where uh, we, with, with Professor Ilan Adler, uh, we decided to, he decided to organize a class to study Karma Kar's original tech report, which is very hard to read. Uh, it's not your typical mathematics of linear programming, but it was more uh, coming from the nonlinear programming side of things. And, and so we took a whole semester of the class to go, th go through his paper. And, and, uh, and, and during that semester, I had my qualifying exam uh, in Berkeley, which is a, it's an oral exam that takes from three to five hours. Uh, very stressful. But in uh, the first part of that exam, to break the ice, uh, one month before, the, the chairman gives you a paper that you should read and prepare and present during the first first 45 minutes of the, of the exam. And the paper that I got was a dual of fine scaling algorithm. My chairman was uh, Ilan Adler, because he wasn't my advisor, thesis advisor. He was just sort of the advisor for this project. And, uh, and, and what I had done uh, is that I implemented, uh, I implemented this, uh, this algorithm uh, using uh, the APL language. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the APL language. But it's like a matrix language that, that was proposed in IBM in the, I don't know, maybe in the, in the 70s, I think. Uh, but it made it very easy to implement Karmakar's algorithm because Karmakar, his algorithm, uh, the cru crucial step was solving a least squares problem to get the direction of improvement. And that's just one line in uh, APL. Uh, so so I, I presented that in, the, in, the, in, my, in my qualifying exam and everything worked well. And then during the summer, Karmakar came to Berkeley to spend the second semester uh, at, the, at the Berkeley's Mathematical Research uh, Institute. And, uh, and uh, uh, he started giving talks and said he was looking for uh, some in the, uh, university partners to implement his algorithm because he, he had given these talks saying that it was 100 times faster, but he didn't, uh, <coughs> uh, AT&T didn't let him describe the, the technical implementation details of, of this. So he was looking for university process. They, they would let him partner with university so that then they could write a paper and describe the results. And so uh, Ilan Adler said, yeah, we'll do it. And then uh, and we got together. And Ilan then uh, uh, got his uh, large systems class. Uh, and his, uh, his large systems class usually was to study decomposition, and then this time uh, we just got the, the whole class and we broke up uh, the, the different tasks and each one of the students worked on one task. And by the end of the class, we almost had a working version of, of his algorithm. Uh, then the uh, semester ended. Uh, Elon Narendra, Geraldo, and myself continued working during the holidays. And, and by uh, April of 19... 86, we had a working version of the algorithm which uh, uh, was faster than the simplex method. And so at the Informs conference, the Tim Zorsa conference in LA in, in April of 86, we presented the first linear programming implementation that was faster than a simplex. Uh, and we wrote a, a couple of papers, uh, one describing the algorithm, uh, which is called the dual of fine scaling algorithm, with uh, some power series extensions. And then, and then, in my opinion, more important was this paper here, where we gave all the details of how to implement this algorithm. And uh, until this point, uh, several groups have tried to implement interior point algorithms, but they were always uh, unsuccessful. And uh, only after this paper came out that uh, successful implementations uh, started to appear, including OB1 that later became the barrier method in Gorobi. Okay, so uh, Narendra was working with me and he liked the results I was getting. So he says, why don't you come work at Bell Labs when, we, when, when you graduate? And so I graduated in 87 
Uh, but at that time, my, my wife was still finishing her PhD uh, in Berkeley, and she still needed a year. Uh, and uh, she was also going to have our first baby during that year. And, and, so, and so I told him that I couldn't go directly to, uh, to New Jersey. Uh, but he suggested then that I work at, at, as a consultant at AT&T's Advanced Decision Support Systems, ADSS, which was the subsidiary that was marketing, trying to develop a commercial version of his algorithm. And, uh, and so I went to work there. And then, and, but when I worked there, I was, I was mainly based in California. I'd go once a month to New Jersey, spend, spend a week. And so during that time, uh, I also uh, started talking with Tom Feo. Uh, Tom Feo and I were colleagues during our PhD in Berkeley. And uh, we, were, we were office mates. And uh, Tom was trying to, uh, after graduation, he was hired by U University of Texas as a professor. And he was trying to recruit me to go to University of Texas. So I traveled to Austin a few times uh, to do uh, some interviews. And, uh, and one of those times, I worked with Tom on a probabilistic heuristic for a difficult set covering problem. And that's how GRASP was born, because that's, this algorithm turned out to be what we now know as GRASP. Uh, we only named it GRASP in 19, 1989. Uh, <clears throat> I eventually got an offer from UT, but another offer from Bell Labs Research. And, and I decided to go to Bell Labs. So, uh, so what, what was this grasp for set covering? So set covering, the way we looked at it was uh, uh, minimize the sum of uh, zero, one variables subject to uh, AX greater than equal to one for A is a zero, one matrix. Uh, and a covering then is gonna be a subset of the A matrix uh, such that for all rows in A, uh, uh, the, the matrix corresponding to that subset of columns uh, in the position ij is equal to one for at least one column. So that means that, that for each row, you'll have at least one column in the cover that's, that's covering that, uh, that, uh, that row. And what we seek is the, is the set of smallest card cardinality. And uh, the reason it was called for a difficult set covering problem is that the matrix A had a special structure that, that made it difficult. So it's a problem that even for a small dimension, uh, it's difficult to solve exactly and find the optimal solution. So, so uh, we proposed, and I had been working on that with Kar Karmakar uh, with a, for a different algorithm. But here we decided to solve it using a heuristic. Uh, and so uh, we first used the Johnson's greedy algorithm. Johnson eventually became my manager at at and uh, David S. Johnson. Uh, so this is a very simple greedy algorithm. It starts with an empty cover. And while S is not a covering, it chooses a column uh, whose inclusion in S covers the greatest number of yet uncovered rows of A. And then it, it adds that, that uh, column to, to J. And it keeps on doing until if, if the problem is feasible, eventually it's going to have a covering. Uh, now, if you uh, greedy algorithm, if you run it once, you get a solution. If you run it again, you're going to get the same solution. Uh, so if we want to run something many times, what we need to do is uh, add some randomization. And so a semi-greedy algorithm then also begins with an empty solution and, and does the same loop, looking for a cover. But at each step, instead of choosing the column that maximizes the, the number of of uh, rows of yet un uncovered rows, it chooses a set of of of, of columns uh, that maximizes a large that that covers a large number of yet uncovered rows. So, uh, and uh, and from that set, it chooses one of them at random, and then it includes that one into the set. So that's how you add a randomization. And then what you do is you. Uh, if you run this a bunch of times, each time you run it, you'll get a different covering, potentially a different covering. Uh, now, uh, solutions produced that way, or with the greedy algorithm, not necessarily are locally optimal. So the PQ uh, local neighborhood of S uh, simply removes P elements from S and adds Q elements to, to, to S, uh, maintaining a valid covering. Uh, now, this, this algorithm, the greedy or the semi-greedy, may not be locally optimal with respect even to the simplest of the PQs, 
which is the one zero. So one zero uh, removes one element and doesn't add any one. So if you have a superfluous column, it'll remove the superfluous column. So it's a column that can be removed while maintaining the cover. And then it repeats this until there are no, cover, there are no columns that can be removed. So, so this is the local search. And so finally, we're ready to, to describe a GRASP, which is you do a multi-start algorithm where at each iteration, you produce a solution using the semi-greedy algorithm. And then you apply local search starting from this solution and then generates a, a locally optimal solution. And at the end, you return the best solution found. So it's a very simple algorithm. Uh, and we wrote a paper uh, in, in 1988, uh, which got published in early 1989. Uh, this paper currently has over 1,600 uh, citations. Uh, so, uh, so in 19, 1988, when I was hired by the I was hired by the research division of, of Bell Labs, so-called Area 11, uh, and I was hired to work in the Mathematical Sciences Research Center in Mary Hill, New Jersey. More specifically, in the Mathematical Foundations of Computing Department, which was headed by David Johnson, and, and that department was very intimidating because it had a lot of famous people working there, like like Johnson himself, Tarjan, Shore, who later became uh, of quantum computing fame, Karmakar, Kaufman, and so on. And, and it was a part of the Mathematical Sciences Research Center, which also had a lot of famous people working there. Uh, Math Sciences Research Center was headed by Gary, and our department was headed by Johnson. And these are the Gary and Johnson of this famous book that uh, anyone who studies complexity has probably read. Uh, so this is a, a picture of uh, the maths, Mathematical Sciences Research Center plus the Computing Sciences Research Center. And just to prove that I was, I was there, uh, this is me <laughs> right in the first row. <laughs> that was before my, my hair got, became gray. But <laughs> uh, okay, so, so uh, Working at Bell Labs at that time was uh, really uh, an exciting uh, thing to do. So uh, Bell Labs had a, a, a deep research culture. So it had a renowned staff. Uh, we had this open doors policy that people could walk into your office, and each office had a blackboard, and so you could just start shooting ideas. And, uh, and, and so it was, it was built for interaction. Uh, and... and uh, there were 1,600 uh, researchers doing basic research. So uh, uh, half of them were working in the physical sciences and the other half in the mathematical and computing sciences. And, and, and there was a center for innovation. Uh, so this book, it, it, it criticizes now that companies say that they're very innovative, but basically they produce, produce apps. Here they produced uh, you know, transistor, data networks, information theory of Shannon, uh, cellular telephony, solar cells, laser, digital transmission of voice, satellite communications, and so on. Oxy++, statistical quality control, S, uh, uh, deep neural networks, vector, uh, support vector machine, and so on. Not to mention, not to mention interior point methods. Uh, <clears throat> so working at, at the labs was like working in a university in some sense. So in the sense that uh, you had freedom uh, to do whatever, do research in whatever you want. We had colleagues there who were working in problems in animal migration in Africa, uh, and they were working in our math sciences research center. Uh, all the work could be published, and we had the freedom of working from home. And this is even this is in like in the 80s, where it was way before it became fashionable to work from home. And so they gave us all the infrastructure. For example, the first uh, uh, communication network uh, connecting homes using uh, cable TV was, was the pr prototype was in, the, was in our lab. Uh, uh, also, uh, it, was, it was a place that was very coveted to go work, so com we competed for talent with universities like Berk Berkeley, Stanford, and MIT. Uh, different from universities, we didn't have to teach. We had very few meetings. Uh, we had these lunches that we called the theory lunch, where people working in uh, theoretical computer science would go get together and, and chat. Uh, we had a lot of funds for equipment, for travel, for visitors. 
And we had a lot of types of visitors. Like we had interns, we had PhD students, we had postdocs, and we had academic consultants. So academic consultant is basically if you, in, if you collaborate with some professor uh, in academia and you want them to come visit you, uh, we would hire, like give them some money so they could make like three trips a year to New Jersey and spend a week uh, uh, each time. And, and, and with so much innovation, of course, there were some Nobel Prize winners at Bell Labs. Uh, currently, Bell Labs has 15 Nobel Prize winners, uh, all but one in, chem in physics, uh, for things like the transistor, the matter wave duality, uh, proof of, of, of suggestion that the Big Bang uh, started, CCD, and so on. And uh, uh, one day I was invited for dinner at a friend's house and uh, I was surprised to see that there was a Nobel Prize winner having dinner with us. And, and this is uh, <coughs> Bob Wilson, who together with Arnold Penzias uh, discovered by, by chance that uh, uh, the microwave background radiation from the Big Bang. Uh, now we don't know if the Big Bang existed, so <laughs> but, but they got there. The... Now closer to us, uh, to our field, uh, there are also many Turing Award winners. Uh, at Bell Labs, including uh, Richard Hamming from Ham Hamming Distance uh, for numerical best, Richie and, and Thompson for the Unix, Tarzan for uh, data structures, uh, Lacoon for deep neural networks, and Aho and Ullman for pro programming languages. So when I joined uh, Bell Labs, David Johnson gave me some advice. Uh, so he was not only my manager, but sort of my mentor. And he said that I should try to attend as many conferences as I could in the first 10 years of my career. Because he said it was good for you to go out there and people know you and can so they can associate your face with your name and so on. And so I followed David's advice and I continue to do <laughs> until now, as you can see. I'm here uh, 40 years later. Uh, <clears throat> So, and that's when I started collaborating with researchers from a number of universities uh, all over the world, in the US, in Europe, in Brazil, and so on. And one of my, my first uh, collaborators uh, was Panos Pardalas. And I, I met Panos in 1988 at a conference, at a workshop on interior point methods uh, in Maine, in the United States. And we began immediately uh, to work on QAP uh, global optimization, and then after on GRASP, and, and now recently in BRKGA. And Panos was my first academic consultant at Bell Labs, and that was in 1990, and he was still at Penn State. And, and to date, we've, uh, we've co-authored 67 papers, co-edited five handbooks, and have two patents. So we've done a lot of work. His wife used to say that Panos has three shifts it's a day, night, and weekends. <laughs> so, so we go there working all the time. Uh, <clears throat> my second uh, economic consultant was Celso Hibero, uh, who I met also at a conference, this time in Alaska in 1994. Uh, and with Celso, we've been working mainly on GRASP and patrolinking, and also more recently on BRKJ. And to date, we've co-authored uh, 38 papers, a book, and two patents. And, uh, and we started writing a book now in BRKJ with Jose Gonçalves this year. And finally, uh, another co-author that we've written a lot of papers with is Paula Festa, who I met first uh, in uh, 1998 when she was a, a visiting scholar at University of Florida with Ponos. And with Paula, we've worked mainly on grass and pathway linking. Uh, she also visited me many times at at and and to date, we've co-authored 40 papers. So uh, in the years 88 to 995, I, I was at Bell Labs. And I started working there. I was more focused on uh, interior point methods because that was really the, you know, you'd go to a, give a talk on interior point methods. If you fill up the room, you, people couldn't even, they had to close the door because there's so many people wanted to come in. So it was really, really exciting. And, and, and so I didn't give much, in, much importance to, to GRASS, but David Johnson uh, always encouraged me to continue working on GRASS. So I, I worked with, with, uh, with Tom on a GRASS for maximum independent set. And uh, so this is the first time that we used the name GRASP uh, in, in the paper. And we finally published this in 
1994. We submitted this paper in 1989, so it took five years of uh, uh, like four or five rounds of reviewing uh, for it finally to appear. Uh, but, I, but I did give a talk on this paper in 1989 at the Arsa conference in New York. Uh, <clears throat> but then, so we saw that, you know, GRASP is, is, is not an algorithm for solving a specific problem, but it's more like a general framework that we could apply to a bunch of different problems. And so in 1991, uh, at, uh, again at the Arsa Tims conference, that's the old name for Informs, uh, Tom and I gave a tutorial on GRASP. And the tutorial was a success. A lot of people were asking questions after. They wanted to, wanted to know if we had a paper. And we said we didn't, but we were going to write one. And so we wrote, we wrote a paper. Uh, and so uh, we submitted in 1992 the paper to management science, and it was rejected. And then in 93, we submitted it to operations research, and again, it was rejected. And then finally, in 1994, we submitted it to Journal of Global Optimization, which was a new journal that Pons had just started. And, and, and it was accepted and finally appeared in print in 1995. And to date, this paper is my most cited paper, has over 4,000 citations. So uh, this is the paper. Uh, so it's just called Greedy Randomized Adaptive Search Procedures. And, and of course, just writing a paper is not enough for people to start using the method. You have to actually uh, evangelize the, the method. So. I would have to write lots of papers and give lots of talks. If you look at my CV, it's full of grasp papers and full of grasp talks over the years. But over the years, if you go to Google Scholar and look for greedy randomized adaptive search procedure, you're going to find over 11,000 uh, hits. It, those are papers either with that in the title or mentioning uh, greedy randomized uh, in, the, in the text. So it's being used for, for a bunch of different... Uh, of, of different applications. Uh, and, and finally, in, in 2016, we published with Salsa a paper, uh, uh, a, a book called Optimization by Grasp. So, uh, so in, the, in the 90s, uh, I worked up until 96 at at and Bell Labs. And in 96, at and uh, decided to split itself into two companies, at and and Lucent Technologies. Uh, Lucent Technologies kept the name Bell Labs, and at and uh, the research division, was rebranded at and Labs. And the research was at and Labs Research. And uh, uh, so at that time, uh, uh, I continued working with Tom Feo a little bit on GRASP, with Geraldo Vega and interior point methods for, for network flows. And, and I started a collaboration with uh, two people in Portugal, Luis Portugal and uh, Joaquin Judz. Uh, from Coimbra. Uh, Joaquin was Luis's uh, professor, and uh, Luis had been working on it, and he found out in, in 1992 or 93 that uh, when he showed his algorithm to some friends that, that we had been working at at and on the same problem. And then uh, uh, his wife later told me that it was like he had lost a child or something like that. But uh, <clears throat> so I went to the to the IFORS conference in, in Lisbon in 1993 and met him, and then we decided to start a collaboration. And so we collaborated and, and worked for uh, another five years on interior point methods for network flows. With Panos, I continued working on quadratic assignment problem. He moved on to the University of Florida. And uh, I, in, in, in Texas, I met Fred Glover, and then he invited me to be part of the inaugural uh, editorial board of Journal of Heuristics. And so I decided then to dive into the area of metaheuristics. Uh, and, and so in 1999, I attended my first metaheuristics international conference. And at that time is when I started also my role as academic advisor, and that at at and at and remember, had the funding to, to bring people in. And also, we, we attracted people uh, with, with their own funding. And so we had uh, interns, short-term visitors. I was in a bunch of PhD thesis defense boards. Uh, I had uh, masters and PhD students that I advised, and also postdoctoral visitors. And uh, uh, this was me with uh, Louise in, uh, back in in the 90s, and uh, and we did uh, our research on this. And finally, we published 
uh, these two papers. Uh, unfortunately, the papers were published after Luis passed away. He had uh, lymphoma and, and he died in 1998, and these papers got published a little bit later. Uh, so this paper describes our algorithm. And this paper here, uh, the algorithm uses a, a preconditioned conjugate gradient to compute the direction uh, of improvement. And uh, so we, are, we analyze this type of preconditioner in this paper and show that uh, as the algorithm converges to the optimal solution, the condition number of the system that needs to be solved, uh, the condition number of the preconditioner, uh, converges to one. So it becomes, it, it, it becomes very fast to solve the, the direction problem using conjugate gradients. And this is when I started go, uh, going to these summer schools. Uh, so there's a summer school, which is the Latin American Iberian uh, uh, summer school in operations research. Uh, my first one that I attended was in Brazil in 1995. And uh, here I am. And, and down here is uh, Renata Yex, who became my first PhD student. Uh, Renata was a student of CELSA. And uh, uh, her thesis, uh, which she developed entirely at 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 and T, uh, was titled "Experimental Analysis of the Probability Distribution of Running Time in Grasp Heuristics." And the main result was that the running time of Grasp to reach a target solution value fits a two-parameter exponential distribution. And in the process, we developed these things that we call TTT plots. Uh, here's examples of TTT plots, where you have the theoretical distribution in dash and then the empirical distribution in, in these, these dots. And, and you see that uh, uh, we did statistical tests to show that these, these fit then this two-parameter distribution. So this is for many graphs for many different types of problems. So for max independent set, for QAP, for graph polarization, for max set, and so on. And we wrote these two papers, uh, the paper describing the, the result of her thesis, and then the paper describing the TT plots. TTT plots are, are interesting for you to compare uh, runs of stochastic local search algorithms. So stochastic local search algorithm will take, a, a, a running time will take, as a, a, a random variable, how long it takes to find a solution. And so if you just compare two runs, that might not mean much, because it could be that you're, one of them is going faster than the other because of the nature of the distribution. But if you, if you do like 100 runs, and then plot the runs, uh, plot, plot the running times here. Uh, here's the times. You get these curves, and this curves here shows that the the grass with path through linking is is faster than uh, or better than the pure pure grass. And you can do that for a bunch of different uh, algorithms. Uh, in 1999, I went to my second Alavio, and then there I met another uh, student, uh, Luciana Burial who uh, then came to be my second PhD student at Shannon Lab. Uh, and so she was a PhD student at Unicamp in Brazil. And her thesis was on traffic routing on the internet. And basically, we were solving using BRKGA the, the weight setting problem in OSPF routing. So OSPF routing uh, packets, they follow a shortest weight path. Uh, but you, as the operator of the network, determine what the weights are. Uh, and, and so you want to determine what the weights are so that if you route all the traffic using this protocol, you get the, the most throughput through, through your network. And so that was her thesis. And uh, after that, she did a postdoc in, in, in Italy, in Rome. And then she went back to Brazil and was a professor in computer science for 15 years at, uh, at the Federal University of Rio do Sul. Uh, and since 2021, she's a principal research scientist at Amazon. So I recruited her uh, to Amazon, and she's there uh, till today. Uh, and we've uh, co-authored 18 papers, and we have four patents. And finally, with my co-authors, uh, Jose Gonçalves. Jose and I were, were colleagues in Berkeley in the 80s. Uh, we both did PhD, and we both did uh, our thesis. Was both, uh, both of our thesis was in sem were on semiconductor manufacturing. And until... Uh, 2002, we hadn't collaborated at all on research. Uh, but then we started collaborating on BRKGA. And from 2005 to 2014, uh, we, had a, we had a grant from the Portuguese National Science Foundation. And we, 
Uh, I would go to Portugal once a, once, a, once a year, and he would come to New Jersey once a year, and we collaborated. And, then, and so by 2011, when we gave BRKGA its, uh, its, its term uh, uh, in the paper that we published in Journal of Heuristic, we had already written nine papers on the subject, and to date we've co-authored 27 papers. So in 2017, I recruited him to work at, uh, at Amazon as a principal research scientist. And he left, left University of Porto and then remained there until last year, uh, where we both retired on the same day, <laughs> December 23rd of 22. Uh, <clears throat> and so we started writing a book on BRKJ with Celso. And here is our bias random key genetic algorithm paper. Um, it doesn't get as many hits as GRASS because it's newer, but it still gets over 2,000 hits if you search on Google Scholar. And then in 2012, I went to my, my last uh, Elavia so far, and that was, in, that was one that was organized by Luciana. Uh, it was near her university in the south of Brazil, and, and, and there I am. And then uh, there I, 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 I got two new PhD students, so uh, Carlos... Jandaraji uh, uh, was a PhD student in computer science at Unicamp, and his, we worked on a bunch of different BRKGA algorithms uh, applied to problems in telecom, including a lot of sophisticated network design of wireless networks and things. And he's currently a principal inventive scientist at at and Labs Research. Uh, and we have seven papers, and we're currently working on a couple more. And the other student was uh, Fernando Stefanello, uh, who was a PhD student in, in, uh, of, of Luciana's. So, so Luciano was my student. He was Luciana's student, so he's my, my academic grandson. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of strange, the, the grandson. He's the son of academic son of my student. But anyway, uh, so we uh, co-advised him, and uh, his thesis was on heuristics for... Uh, network problems. He worked on an assignment of uh, virtual virtual machines in a data, data center. And he's currently working at uh, a startup in Brazil. And we have three papers together. So j now just a, f a few words about David Johnson. He was uh, perhaps the best manager you could, you could hope to, to have. Uh, he was my manager for 25 years. Uh, for this period, so in two different organizations, so the Mathematical Foundation of Computing Department to 96, and then Algorithms and Optimization Research Department to 2013. And uh, well, since 2008, we had been doing research on this problem, which was a, it's like a location of sensors in a network to measure quality of service, uh, but has lots of other applications. So the title of the paper is Near Optimal Disjoint Path Facility Location through set cover by pairs. And this paper, we, we started working on this, on the research in 2008, and the paper was published only in 2020. And uh, had a bunch of authors on it, uh, most of them, uh, I think all, all of them from AT&T, they were either temporary or permanent uh, positions there. Uh, but uh, around 2000 and, and, and uh, and 14 or 2015, David uh, was diagnosed with cancer. And then he, uh, right before he went to surgery, he sent me an email with, uh, with a zip file of all the, all, the, all the files of programs and data and everything related to, to this problem, saying that I'm sure nothing's going to happen, but just for safekeeping, let, uh, keep this for us so that you can, in case we need, you can take over from here and finish the paper. And unfortunately, he had some complications and he passed away. And so uh, in 20, that was in 2016. And so for 2016 on, I took over uh, the full responsibility of getting this paper out. And by 2019, I think we had, uh, we had uh, submitted a, uh, yeah, 20, yeah, around there, I can't read that number, but, but uh, we submitted, then that's operations research that takes a long time to, to get reviewed. And finally, it, it appeared in print in 2020. Uh, this is a really nice paper. It, it covers theory, uh, approximation algorithms, heuristics, exact methods, uh, and experimental results. 
So why would I want to leave at and uh, research? And it's such a nice place to, to be. And, and there's some historical reasons. So one is that Bell Labs used to be this super famous place uh, until the, the government broke, broke at and up in two pieces, uh, into several pieces. So it broke, uh, broke at and into a long distance company called at and And then Bell Labs became at and Bell Labs. And then there are the baby bells. So there are local companies with monopoly for local telephony. These are the baby bells. And, and their, their laboratory was called Bellcore. Then the dot-com bubble burst in 2001. And then AT&T decided again to break itself apart voluntarily this time. And it became, part of it became Lucent Technologies, which kept the name Bell Labs. And then the other part became uh, AT&T, which was a service company. Uh, this is a systems company, a service company, and that was at and Labs. And then, and then eventually in, uh, in, uh, in 2006, at and was acquired by one of the ba baby labs, one of the baby bells, uh, uh, SBC. And, they, and then SBC changed its name to, uh, to at and uh, so, so the reasons that I had for leaving were first, Started with 2001, the dot-com uh, bubble burst, and it affected all of the telecom industry, including AT&T, which had to make uh, a lot of cuts. And, and one of the first cuts that they made was in the research staff. So on one day in February of 2002, they decided to lay off 60% of the research staff. We had about 600 people in research, and, and almost 400 got laid off on that day. But the, our group of optimization, we, we all survived and, uh, and we stayed on. Uh, but then there are a lot of people who thought that they had a tenured position working there, uh, and then they finally realized that they did not. And so they started, a lot of people started leaving to go to university. So from 2002 to 2006, we had a bunch of voluntary departures. At the same time, AT&T was firing, firing pe people left and right. And so from 2002 to 2006, the number of employees went from 175,000 to around 40,000. So every Friday there were pink slips going out and people were getting laid off. And they were doing this to make the company look attractive to a buyer. And, and finally in 2006, SBC acquired AT&T and then changed its name to AT&T. So basically they acquired the name AT&T and they got the labs as a, as a, as a reward for that. But there were, SBC is a, was, is a, was a sort of conservative company since they were in a, they had like a, 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 a monopoly for local telephony. And, uh, and, and so they, they didn't like research that much. So, so they kept on firing people from the labs. And, 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 and then in two, 2013, Kim, uh, uh, finally our team, our department was closed. Uh, and, and just a few months later, David Johnson was fired from, uh, he was laid, laid off after 40 years uh, there. And so lots of people from our team started leaving also. And by 2014, only David Applegate and myself uh, were left uh, at AT&T. And so in 2014, I moved to Amazon and David, two years later, moved to Google. At Google, there were already 80 former AT&T labs researchers working there including the head of research at Google is Corina Cortez, who, who used to work uh, at, at at and so, so I went to Amazon, uh, Seattle, uh, and I was hired as a principal research scientist in the modeling and optimization group, uh, MOP, uh, which is headed by Russell Algor, who is Amazon's chief scientist. Uh, and together with MOP, uh, together with me, MOP hired another two uh, Two people, Renato Vernac, who had, who had once been an uh, intern of mine at at and and Andrew Goldberg, famous for his max flow algorithms, uh, from Microsoft uh, Research Silicon Valley. And they had, uh, Microsoft had shut down that lab and, and laid off the entire staff. So these guys were open for work. And, and so in 2015, a year later, I became an affiliate professor of industrial engineering because I wanted to advise a PhD student, and you had to be an affiliate professor to be able to do that. So, so uh, I started uh, this role of, of advisor. And at AT&T, basically what, what I had to work on was this network. 
So we have uh, fulfillment centers. Then we have different ways of getting the, the, the packages from the fulfillment center to the customer premise. I can use trucks, airplanes, and so on. And there are sortation centers. Uh, and so basically, we, we had to, uh, one, design this network, so decide where to put, where and how many, and when to put, to put the fulfillment centers, and I mentioned the fulfillment centers, and then in each region, how many, how many uh, hubs we're gonna have. Uh, could be sortation centers, or could be Amazon, or, or third-party hubs, and then placing the delivery stations, and then, and then deciding how to interconnect these, uh, these boxes to have the lanes. So that was one of the things that we needed to do. And, and the other thing was to operate this network. So we had uh, basically two main big problems. One was what's called the middle mile problem. So it, it, it basically figures out how to operate uh, from the fulfillment center to the delivery stations. And then finally, the last mile uh, takes things from the delivery stations to the customer. And so uh, in the last mile, we came up with this zone-based routing, which is now used worldwide. Uh, it's several tens of millions of packages are, 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 are delivered using this, this algorithm. And basically, um, we have a region that we have to deliver, deliver the packages in, and we break that region into zones. And each zone has approximately 10 packages per day on average. Uh, to be delivered, so the zones in the in the in the more dense are going to be smaller, and the rural areas are going to be bigger. And then what we do is we we have a master trace, which basically is a is a is a Lagrangian is a Lagrangian Hamiltonian path uh, through the centroids of these zones. And then what we do is we cut this path at certain places, and and then we'd, we'd assign the first uh, part of the path to driver one, and the second part of the path to driver two. Now, this just gives us a sequence of uh, zones that the driver is going to visit. Uh, but so what we needed to do is, uh, is then decide which will be the first location that the driver is going to uh, is going to deliver, and which will be the last location that the driver is going to deliver. Uh, and that's, of course, going to depend on what was the last location in the previous zone. Uh, so we use some dynamic programming to figure that out, uh, the last and first, the entry point and the exit point. And then we use, since it's only 10 packages per zone, we can actually solve that exactly uh, for each zone. Uh, and there's more to it, but this has some implications in how the operation of delivery takes uh, place. So I have on, on YouTube several videos where I describe, give talks about, about this, and uh, they're available uh, if you search for them. And in the middle mile, probably we, we want to send stuff on these trucks uh, from the fulfillment center to sortation center, for example, sortation center to delivery station. And basically, the goal is to assign drivers uh, to, uh, to sets of loads uh, between OD pairs with the option of sending the subset of loads to third-party carriers. And there could be many different objectives, like minimize empty load distance traveled, or maximize the savings with respect to sending everything to third-party care. And, uh, and, uh, and there are constraints, so time window constraints, and, and there's uh, driver constraints. So some of the drivers, they need to uh, have, uh, they have some constraints related to their uh, what time they'll, they'll start working, what time they'll, they'll stop working, uh, and so on. Uh, and so Larissa Petroiano, who, who I was advising, uh, finally finished her PhD in 2020. In 2019, 2018 and 2019, she was an intern at Amazon and, and worked in the middle mile. So her thesis was exact and heuristic methods for problems in middle and last mile uh, logistics. And after her PhD, she was hired as a, as a research scientist at Amazon. But unfortunately, earlier this year, she was impacted by the massive layoffs that the tech industry had. And so she left Amazon, and uh, she's now working at another e-commerce company, Walgreens Boot Alliance. And during her PhD, she wrote a paper on, uh, on vaccine uh, distribution 
in Mozambique, uh, which, which competed for the OR uh, for Development Prize uh, in, uh, in IFORS 2021 and in Co. And it was a fi finalist in that competition. So uh, just to finish, a few words about research at Amazon. There's an umbrella organization called Amazon Science that sort of brings together all the researchers. The research in, in AT&T was, was centralized. Research in Amazon is distributed. Uh, so, but AT&T had a 100-year tradition, right? Bell Labs was founded in 2025. Uh, Amazon was only founded in, in uh, 1994. And only in 2001, they hired their first scientist. Who, who was Russell Algor, the guy who hired in MOP? Uh, so when I started hiring, when I was hired in Amazon in 2014, Amazon had 154,000 employees, and had about uh, and had about uh, 200 uh, fewer than 200 scientists. And now eight years later, there were more than 1.6 uh, million uh, employees and 9,000 scientists. And, and so the science organization really grew, and. Uh, there were scientists working in a bunch of different areas, and this is just a sample of the areas, logistics, devices, robotics, cloud computing, computational advertising, machine learning, quantum computing, and so on. And so Amazon, because of this growth and this reliance on, on, on scientists and things, uh, had a lot of interaction with universities. And so they have uh, yearly, they employ thousands of interns uh, they use universities for recruiting. Uh, they have the Amazon Research Awards uh, that covers uh, grants to cover research by, by PhD students and postdocs. Uh, they have an Amazon Scholar Program, and they also have the Visiting Academics Program, uh, undergraduate fellowships, and a new postdoc program. Uh, and, and I'll say just one word about Amazon Scholar. Uh, for those of you who are in academics and are interested, this is an opportunity for academic researchers to visit Amazon for a short period of time. They can go from three months to two years, even though there are some people who have been there longer than two, two years. Uh, and they work on an applied project. Uh, it could be in AI, machine learning, natural language processing, optimization, game theory. And, and, and one of the hidden truths about this program that in fact it's something that's very useful for recruiting. So we bring the people in and they, and they end, end up liking it and then they'll, they'll stick around. And so I recruited Luciana uh, as an Amazon scholar in 2019 and without even talking to her after she left, she decided on her own that she wanted to come back and then two, two years later she was hired as a research scientist. And uh, so Amazon has this uh, it's always growing, right? So we have to interview a bunch of people. And during my eight years, I interviewed over 200 people. Uh, and the interviews are, are, are in, uh, a long process. So it involves recruiting, phone screens, uh, bringing in the candidate uh, for an interview, where the candidate gives a one-hour talk and has a series of, of interviews. And at the end, the candidate is exhausted. Uh, and, and after the interview, uh, a bar raiser and the interviewers vote. Bar raiser is someone, in Amazon you have to raise the bar to be hired, and so, and so they have someone called a bar raiser who has been to thousands of, uh, of interviews and, and this person knows what it is to, to raise the bar. And, uh, and, and so people then vote and then they comment online and then they meet to decide and it has to be unanimous. You can, you can change your vote during this meeting. Uh, and uh, and this, this same group meets uh, before uh, the, uh, the interview to design the interview. And basically, the interview, you have uh, technical questions like, like science depth, science breadth, science application, uh, sometimes coding. Uh, but then you have these uh, behavioral uh, areas that you have to cover, and they all have equal weights. So you have to raise the bar and every, everything, and the and the technical part as well as in the as in this part here, and uh, and and so now there's there used to be 14. Now there are two two more. There are 16 uh, of, these, of these principles, and uh, yeah, and so and so I decided to retire, and 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 go back to. Uh, to doing just research full time on my, on my terms. 
And, uh, and so my new role now is a visiting professor, and I started by teaching a one-month-long graduate course at ITA in Brazil, and then I visited a bunch of universities in, in Spain and in, and, in, and in Portugal. And I've been, of course, attending conferences, and I think David Johnson would, would be happy to see that. And, uh, and uh, I'm going to have some contacts in Australia, and I'll be on an advisory board. And, and so what I'm doing now is doing research, writing papers, giving talks, collaborating with friends. Uh, we began editing the second edition of the Handbook of Heuristics, and, uh, and we're writing this, this book. And so it's keeping me busy, and, uh, and, uh, and I'm glad that that's true. <laughs> and so thank you very much for your attention. Amazing career, I've got to say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Any, yeah. Any, any questions? Just we've got time for one. Okay. Well, I'll just I'll ask you actually okay. of, of all the things that you've done. You know, which is the the thing that I suppose uh, quite a varied career. But if you had to pick one thing, what was the most you know uh, poignant that you'd like to? Yeah, I think that in, in, at at and t there was a time that we were this whole big data stuff was starting, and uh, we it was called massive data sets, and so we we were analyzing the the call graph uh, 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 structure of the call graph, where, where a node is a is a phone number, and there's an arc if there's a there's a phone call, and you have this data for a bunch of, of months. And then uh, trying to understand how the what the structure of that graph is. That was that was one of the most exciting. Excuse me, we 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 just finish off the questions. Could we? Thank you. Please. Yeah. So that was that was one of the. There are so many exciting things. So the beginning with the Karma Car algorithm was super exciting, and then when I joined Amazon, also it was a whole different world. Uh, I learned a lot. Of, I had never worked in logistics before, so. It was most of the stuff. The first year, I didn't understand anything that was going on. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so so this is very, it was varied. I like to do varied things. I like to work with lots of different people. Usually, I work with uh, many projects in, in per parallel. So they move slowly, but they, mm. at the end, they all get to the they all get to uh, the finish line. You publish papers, speak yeah. volumes of that. Um, Mauricio, thank you so much okay, for thank sharing you. this. Okay, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.